everyone. Um, I'm Chris Hewitson. Uh, I work for uh, uh, an engineering company normally called uh, Mott McDonald. Uh, I am an archaeologist, or, you know, still tend to be. Um, and um, this is kind of, this talk basically came out of my experience of uh, the last three years in work. Uh, I started my job in December 2015, uh, a nice office just up the road. Um, and then um, this happened about three weeks after I started. And it, this is kind of um, me really understanding about flooding and its impact on the historic environment through my work over the last three years. Um, for those who don't know this, just look behind you. It's basically just there on the River Air. Um, in December 2015, uh, there was quite catastrophic floods in Leeds. Um, uh, you'll be pleased to know that Leeds Flood 1, Phase 1, is finished. So we're safe where we are at the moment. Don't worry about that. Um, but it, this is more um, a collection of sites I've been working on over the north of England. But it's more kind of a thought process about different things that we've been doing. Um, and a case study at the end to look at something specifically. Isabel set me up very nicely for some of my thoughts, so that's good. Um, changing riverscapes. So um, I would say the historic environment, it's, it's not a static thing. Um, what we're looking at is a change in the historic environment. But I'd just like to kind of talk through what we're looking at in, in Yorkshire specifically. So if you kind of look at Yorkshire, it's kind of dictated by its geography. Um, in the northwest, you've got like the limestone Yorkshire Dales, and that creates uh, an environment up in pasture, quite wide valleys. If you come down, um, the millstone grits actually create a slightly different environment. It um, tends to be more moorland, heather moorland on the uplands, and you tend to get slightly narrower river valleys, and that has a different effect on the flooding um, that you get in those areas. It tends to be more rapid, and then some of the slower flooding areas further down. Um, as you go further down, you see different areas like the floodplains. So you've got the Triassic uh, um, bedrock there. But you tend to get more fluvial deposition in the lowlands. I'm not a geologist, so I won't go too far into this. But if you look at Yorkshire, it's essentially created by its river scape. Um, this is a map from the 1890s. And essentially, I like to think of Yorkshire as everything from south from the Tees and north from the Humber, and that's basically all the rivers and everything in Yorkshire is that. If you look at a traditional map of Yorkshire as opposed to the 1972 map, it basically the, the, the ridings of Yorkshire are actually split by the rivers into different parts of the, the landscape. What I'd like to talk about here is, is basically the things that I think, some of the three, three of the critical things that have changed this historic landscape, changed the riverscape. Um, not necessarily totally responsible for flooding, but the different aspects of um, um, the landscape have changed. One of the things that's changed is um, there's been more industry. Now, um, throughout Yorkshire, the industry tends to focus on the valley bottoms rather than tops, and that means you get a, a much more confined settlement. Um, particularly in the 70s, you tend to get more mills, um, and the channel gets much narrower because you, you're building in that channel and you get infrastructure in that channel, which kind of restricts the surface flow of water and surface water flow. But there's also been a change to upland agriculture, um, particularly in those millstone grit areas. Um, you, you basically get a period of enclosure from the 17th century. It gets more rapid in the 18th century. Um, a small <coughs> farm holdings are taken from the moorland and used by the um, used by basically people who work in the mills and have a part-time agricultural industry. We also get changes to the lowland plains. I'm going to read because I get this wrong. So one of the things about the lowlands is I, when I first came to do my work, I looked at the lowlands and I thought, oh yeah, that's just a big uh, river plain. But it was only after doing work and research that I realised that the majority of the lowlands we see has actually been um, drained. Um, a bloke called Cornelius Vermoudin, apologies for my Dutch, but he came along, basically started um, started the process of lowland um, basically capture. Excuse me, I've got my notes. Um, he altered the landscape, and he used a technique called warping. Now, warping is basically building a, a levee around the, the flood pane, 
allowing it to flood and basically filling in that with silt over a series of years. Um, this basically was used across the entirety of the Isle of Axholm, uh, which is, for those who don't know it, it's, it's the bit between the Trent and the Don, um, in the southwest, southeast part of Yorkshire, um, just on the border of Lincolnshire. Now that was kind of repeated over the rest of the county in the lowlands of uh, the Eyre and the Calder and particularly the um, views. Uh, now I'm going to talk about flood alleviation schemes, that's what I essentially do for a living. I talk to uh, flood modelers, I talk to engineers and try to help them uh, design their schemes so they have a lower impact on the historic environment. Um, now there's two sorts of flood schemes I deal with. The, 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 the kind of one that people will be familiar with is building embankments. Uh, and building solid walls. You can go outside, look at Leeds Flood. There's a good example there of where we built the levels up so it doesn't flood over the top. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about actually is something slightly different. Um, is uh, It's called uh, natural flood management. So I want to talk about how you can have a positive impact on the historic landscape. So what's natural flood management? Um, here's a series of acronyms. I love dealing with acronyms. Uh, but this is what the Environment Agency refers to as natural flood management. It's basically, in a nutshell, it's trying to make the river do what the river does. It's trying to make the streams do what the streams do. Um, here's a kind of example uh, from the A's website. And I've just focused on two or three of those. So, for example, floodplain restoration is natural flood management. It's the idea that you, you make the floodplain flood again. And in the upland areas, you know, the idea of using woodland to slow the water down. And the whole idea of natural flood management is essentially to take water and rather than it coming down the hillside very, very rapidly, reaching the cities and towns, it slows it right down and basically uh, allows that water to come um, dissipate into cities over a much slower basis. So here's a good example, um, uh, just the road from me on the hillside. You look at that and you think that's quite a natural environment, but the reality I would turn around and say is you've got quite good examples of natural flood management there. You've got uh, a catchment from a cross lake woodland, and you've also got floodplain restoration, so it's doing what floodplains are meant to do. And this is uh, another example, basically, of um, natural flood management. Um, and it's uh, Griffin South, is basically at the end of um, the Tees. Um, it's a uh, creek. And the idea is that this is uh, basically an environment of um, creeks and rivers as they flow out to sea on the edge of the Tees. So, Griefham South um, was originally designed to basically prevent flooding. Um, the impacts that occurred were um, from a number of different flooding episodes, but basically coming up from the sea, so it's tidal impacts as well as flooding from um, the river system itself. So it's the idea the tide comes in and over tops the embankments. Uh, in 2013, there was a catastrophic breach of the existing flood defences, and this resulted in millions of pounds worth of damage to local industry and homes in uh, Port Clarence Village. You can see the industries in the back there. It's a bit like Mordor up there uh, on a good day. Um, the flood defences that were designed were um, designed to increase the standards of protection um, for 350 homes, 32 businesses, and uh, it's basically designed for a, a one in what they call a one in 200 year flood, so that's the highest level of protection. But also designed um, using modelling on the idea that sea level is going to rise, and the sea level they're predicting for 2065, so 50 years time. Uh, the Environment Agency partnered with two businesses um, that are present in the area, Innovin um, and Savic. Uh, these are both like, chemical and petrochemical industries and they, they gave land and uh, money to help with the scheme. Um, and the idea was they had to actually work quite closely with uh, uh, Natural England and the RSPB because adjacent to this is a really important site for overwintering birds. And so it's the idea to extend this entire scheme and create this environment that would be good for overwintering birds. But one of the things I'm looking at is, is basically how this has a positive impact on this historic landscape. And the idea that, you know, what we're seeing here is historic landscape, yes. 
there's lots of different periods of that, but actually by changing it, we're having a really positive benefit to that local environment. Um, so what was the historic landscape? So um, this is from the HR, um, and it shows basically it was a really important area for medieval salt making. Um, they used a series of things called saltons. Saltons sit on the um, salt marshes when the, when the tide comes in, as Otis Redding said, and when it goes back out again, it, it basically captures salt and basically leaves that salt to, and they, they, they put it in pans and they evaporate it to create uh, salt, which they basically need to sell. It was, um, it was started by the um, um, Durham Priory, basically, in the medieval period. Um, they managed it from the small village of Kelpen, which is southwest of this slide. Um, so, if you look at this environment, you see an environment that's basically been changed over time. So after the medieval period, they started to re reclaim this land. Um, they built flood embankments from the 18th century and built those embankments around the area. And it meant this whole area became pasture as opposed to this salt marsh and the flooding actually stopped. Now, part of this proposal for the scheme was to basically revert this whole process and allow it to flood again. So what we did, one of the issues that immediately occurred was that um, there's a potential to damage these saltings by that process. So we had to do a bit of research and find out that actually the speed of the water coming in from that flooding process and the speed of that water going out again wasn't going to damage those because it's such a slow process. It infiltrates slowly. But it also um, allowed us to have a look at some of these things. We, you can see there we're, we're building embankments for two of the sites. Um, it allows us to work out what they were. Now before, nobody's quite sure what they could be. But it, when we looked at that section, it really looked a nice sterile section. Uh, but it turns out it was mainly clay deposits. And it looks like they were building these salt and these large mounds up. And it allows the water to come in, be stored behind those mounds, and collect, collect it for salt making. But it also allowed us to look at a bit of a wider landscape. So, you know, the, we had an extension to the scheme down here, and it allowed us to do a bit more LIDAR work. So Joe sat at the back did his LIDAR work, which is basically uh, showed us that the, um, the kind of main area of salt marshes was used uh, for salt exploitation. And you can see that the, the great thing about LIDAR is you do get that topography which isn't always visible on the ground because it looks very, very flat. But the saltons were actually generally an area of the salt marshes rather than, you know, further out and extended beyond. But actually, the, it also allowed us to look at some of the other agricultural use. And it was clear that what was happening was further in there, we were getting ridge and furrow, and it was actually being used by the people of Calpen on the edge of the marsh uh, for their agricultural use. Um, it also allowed us to work out the height of the saltons generally were designed to be at the highest kind of tides as opposed to the uh, kind of low tides. And so it's a high tides trap water, and over time that will allow salt to be made. So this is kind of the point I'm making. I, I look at this picture and I say to myself, um, you know, that was, that was a historic environment which was flat and it didn't flood anymore. You can see where the breaches have made, been made in the flood defences, and now it's reverted, in my mind, this, this, this historic environment, something which was much more similar to that medieval environment. So although it's a change to the historic environment, it's actually respecting the previous historic environment that was there before, um, the landscape that you've reverted to. And so you get the creeks reappear and the sultans themselves are actually back again in that kind of historic landscape of the medieval salt making. So Kind of my conclusions were, it, it's kind of looking at natural flood management as a whole and um, it was really saying natural flood management schemes can actually have impacts on individual assets, yes, but they have other heritage benefits, unbelievably for schemes that I work on, there are heritage benefits and I think the idea of going back to this historic landscape is a really good thing, you know, the idea that you can start to relocate land, landscapes that were there before by these schemes. Um, but it's important to remember the landscape we see has changed. It's not the one that was there before. And these natural flood management schemes are likely to create new landscapes, but actually the reality is they respect those old landscapes to some extent. Um, and it's, it's how we look at the balance of those benefits.
So is that, is that a benefit? Is that not a benefit? I look at it personally. A lot of the time we're doing these skits, I, I do think that is an actual benefit to the historic environment. Unbelievably, in a lecture about climate change, we've we'll, we'll talked about negative impacts. Uh, that is me. Thank you very much.